What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Fitness Experiment Podcast. Thank you very much for tuning in. I think you guys are really going to dig this week's episode. Very cool discussion. Discussion. Jesse and I talk about the hormonal response to exercise training. We talk about how this differs between aerobic training, anaerobic training, resistance training. We also talk about the details of, in quotations, adrenal fatigue or this concept of overtraining. We talk about why steady state cardio, so this idea of just hammering away on the treadmill, hammering away whatever it may be, constant running, why this is not the best option for fat loss. Um, We also talk about some of the problems that exist in the fitness industry in terms of how they promote some of these different training modalities. So how they promote resistance training, how they promote HIIT training. We talk about some of the problems with this and why it can be very, very misleading. Now, as is customary, before we get started... Here is your biohack of the week. So do you sometimes wake up in the middle of the night sweating? You wake up in the morning sweating. Maybe it disrupts your sleep. Well, this could be because you are eating too close to bedtime. So when we eat food, it has a thermogenic effect, which means it increases our body temperature. This is contradictory to sleep because... Before bed, our body begins to cool down, so if you feel yourself getting cold later on in the night, this is a good signal that it's time to go to bed. Now, eating food right before bed can prevent this, meaning we won't get as well of a night's sleep. Worse than this is kind of if it's a high-protein meal, because protein is even more thermogenic. It's the most thermogenic of all the macronutrients. So this is why I don't necessarily agree with the bodybuilding concept of crush that protein shake right before you go to bed. This is why. All right. Without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this week's episode. Hormonal response to training. Remember, if you enjoy this, please share this with your friends. Give us a five-star rating and review. That'll bump us up. It'll help us. Get this content out to more people. It'll help us generate more and more episodes. Enjoy. Oh, hang on to a rug. Oh. <laughs> Magic carpet Surely styles. Okay. Sometimes the devil <laughs> and everything blows over, though. Oh, God, we're recording. Oh, are we? <laughs> we're on. <laughs> the Fitness Experiment Podcast is in business. Official name. Yeah, we got Copyright. our name. <laughs> So you, t- who's gonna kick us off first? Yeah, we should. Uh, we might have to copyright this soon. <laughs> That's expensive, though. Yeah. Have you done that for your, or maybe it's called something else? Incorporated. I haven't had to yet. No. no, the gym is, but my stuff isn't yet. Yeah, no. it's expensive. I don't really understand though what like the pros and cons of it are. Really, yeah, it's over my head. No, that's why I have business <laughs> coaches and accountants to help me with yeah. stuff like that because I, I don't know. It's not what I'm good at. Yeah. No. <laughs> not going to take the time to get better at it either. You got to make a choice. It's like, what am I going to put my time into? Oh, yeah. It's like, I understand how important the business and accounting and stuff side of it is, but I really take give a, a year shit. for me. I'll pay somebody else to do it for me. Yeah. It's like, I'm not going to, you know, like if my car breaks down and it's anything more than like a flat tire or like, I need an oil change or something. I can take it to the mechanic. I can pretend and be <laughs> yeah. like, yep, yeah, open the hood and be like, yep, she's broke. But I'm not going to know what to do with it. That's a great so we got to pay for somebody to do it. Couldn't agree more. With that, welcome to the Fitness <laughs> Experiment Podcast. I'm Chet Benning from Brain Ignition here with Jesse Share from Share's P- Performance Academy. How you doing, Jesse? Good, man. Good. <laughs> We're talking hormones today. We had a few people, uh, they didn't call in, but they messaged us and said they're interested in hearing more about kind of the hormonal response to exercise, how that changes or how that is different between male and female, that sort of thing. So we're going to dig into this today as it relates to health and nutrition as always. Yeah, right on. This is something I don't have a lot of expertise on, so... It's going to be fun to learn some stuff from you and then contribute 
I'll do my best. Many things, <laughs> obviously, where I can. Um, we were talking before we started recording. Yes. And there's an unfair question of what a hormone is. So I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna ask you to uh, give me the a, a definition the of a hormone nine definition. Yeah. Um, but I do know one what, or two yeah. things that can maybe help people. A couple stuffs. Yeah. So hormone, you can, how can I word this? You can kind of think of hormones as mailing a letter. So they're kind of, they're secreted from different tissues throughout the body, but they take, they take a little bit of time until they take effect. So like mail, you have to wait till it gets there. Same thing with hormones. The effects aren't always immediate. Um, the release is the release may happen right away, but the hormone then may travel usually through the bloodstream. And so it takes a little while to take its effect. Um, another thing, a lot of these, I guess if we stick with the male comparison, maybe male workers are working shift work. A lot of these hormones similarly follow their own rhythm. So they're often released at, um, the same time throughout the day. Um, and act sort of with our circadian rhythm. So for instance, cortisol, it's, or if our system is working, it should be secreted first thing in the morning, it should be low at night. Um, so this is, it's called pulsatile. So it's just released all at once and then kind of goes away. So hormones are like male. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that helps. That's perfect. Good. Okay. Cortisol. That's a scary word. That's one of those ones that I think people don't really know a whole lot about, but throw it around like nobody's business, right? It's like, Oh, mm -hmm. that's going to raise my cortisol levels. Um, I guess question one, is that a thing? You just mentioned that it's all secreted at once in the morning. So how could that, how could an exercise or a food or an activity or some event in your day affect that cortisol level? Um, and what is it actually for? Yeah. Cortisol is a bit of a scary word. It's, popular these days definitely we hear it all the time we don't often really hear kind of the full story of cortisol it just it has a bad rep because it's 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 linked to stress which it is so to back up so yes um to give you kind of the full definition so cortisol release is initiated from our hypothalamus of our brain this sends signals to the pituitary this then sends, sends signals to our adrenal glands and it's our adrenal glands, which actually are producing this cortisol. So this is a normal response. This is necessary for survival. And the function of cortisol is usually to energize us. It's to wake us up, but it's also to help us deal with stress. So for instance, in the morning it is necessary. So if this, system is running optimally we have that initial release of cortisol in the morning and this is what wakes us up for the day this is what energizes us so in fact if we don't feel energized when that, that alarm goes off if we don't want to get out of bed maybe we feel groggy again just overall feeling of fatigue it's very possible that we don't have that we're not getting that initial secretion of cortisol. So that's one sign to suggest that this system is not working. Now, when we look at stress, because that's often how we hear about cortisol, this same system, so the HPA axis that I mentioned, so hypothalamus to pituitary to adrenal gland and then cortisol, this is also what's initiated when we feel stressed. So when you feel anxious, um, whatever, maybe you have a deadline, some event coming up you're worried about or just someone cuts you off in traffic whatever it may be that's when we also get that release of cortisol um so having this every once in a while no problem at all again this is necessary for survival the cortisol acts as it's actually a survival mechanism is what it is to kind of mobilize us and help us deal with that stressor but the problem uh, comes from having this kind of axis activated all the time. So when we have these chronic levels of cortisol, that's when the problems arise. So that's when we get, um, we, we often hear this called adrenal fatigue. Um, 
maybe we can talk about this later. It's, it, it is, it is adrenal fatigue. That's not really the proper term for it, but when you feel constantly fatigued, you can't recover, you never feel rested. Um, this is often from experiencing too much stress, having too much cortisol too frequently. We also get um, we can get chronic inflammation, we can get increased um, fat storage, all these things can happen when we have an elevation in cortisol, because we have to remember that this is a survival mechanism. So if you have cortisol elevated all the time, your body thinks you're in danger, it thinks your life is under threat, it's going to start storing extra fat because it thinks you need to survive for a long period of time, for instance, without food. So all these things kind of kick into high gear when we have chronic cortisol. But at the end of the day, it's, again, it's like often with health and nutrition, it really depends on the circumstances. So cortisol isn't inherently bad. It's actually very, very necessary. We need it at certain times of the day. It's just that when it's, when it's released becomes untimed, so for if we don't get it in the morning if we have it at night then it's going to keep us up we can't sleep so if it becomes dysregulated that's when all of these problems can arise that's a conversation that comes up with me a lot in just for coaching and um <clears throat> programming clients as well that i don't get to see that often um is that they want to see a body composition change and the request to me as a person who's writing their programming or the person who's coaching them through is to change their diet or to increase the intensity or volume kind of their quest go either way. Right. Oh, I want harder workouts or, Oh, I want more work <clears throat> in hopes that these two things are going to somehow override our hormone hormone response in our body. And then that's going to cause them to lose weight. And I can't in good conscience be like, yeah, I'll do that stuff for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then <clears throat> here we go. <laughs> okay. Cleared. And I can't in good conscience give those people more work to do more, which more stress. Yeah, exactly. It's, a, it's another yeah. stressor Yeah. or change their diet, which can be an emotional stress. Or if I'm doing a really terrible job as a coach, reducing their caloric intake to a dangerous level that's a terrible stress so basically what people are asking of me is to throw more stressors at them which is just going to throw this cycle of um, chronic um, elevated levels of cortisol am i using that right yeah definitely okay. um in hopes that we're just going to skip over and then that's going to cause them to lose body fat what needs to be understood by this person is that it's the stress in their life that's causing them to not be able to achieve the body composition goals that they want. So when they request these things from me and I come back to be like, well, why don't you just like slow down a little bit, right? You're always on the go. You're running, running, running. It's like, oh, well, that's my life. I'm like, well, I don't know. Like it breaks my heart, but I don't know what to tell you because if these things don't change, then that thing's not going to change. Right. And, and I can't do anything from a, a numbers point and from like a, a pen to paper sort of programming approach to magically come up with some magic formula that your hormones don't matter in your dose response or in your composition or in anything in your life. And it's all about the program. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. That's yeah. That's a very good point that I think people always forget about this. Like, in, in terms of fitness performance, you know, wanting that weight loss, wanting to reach that next level, people always forget the huge impact that their lifestyle does have on this. Because like you explained perfectly, if you're, if, if you're experiencing higher levels of stress in your life than normal, if you're not sleeping as well, if you are in a little bit of a caloric deficit, that is not the time to increase your level or pardon me, your amount of training, your amount of exercise. If anything, that's a time to reduce it because like you said, exercise is, it's a stressor to the body. It's a, in the end, it's a beneficial stressor, but initially it is actually harmful to our body and brain. And that's why in the long run, it is good for us because we do adapt to it, but there is a fine line kind of follows that inverted U shape. It's beneficial. 
until you increase, mm -hmm. increase, increase your training volume. And then eventually it becomes detrimental and then you don't even adapt anymore. Right. And so, yeah, you make a great point. Like you said, if there's all these stressors in your life, you are not going to benefit from increasing volume and you'll probably actually experience negative consequences yeah. from doing that. And I get where they're coming from. It's a very natural thing to come to yeah. your coach with. It's like, I want just more because whatever we're doing right now isn't enough because I'm not seeing, but it's like, yeah, you got to flip that. You got to look at yourself first and be sure that you're taking care of yourself. Another thing that I get a lot is that like people sleep like five, six hours a night. Yeah. And then they're like, Oh, that's all I need. And I'm like, what, <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. That's a, that's not a thing. Right? Like right. people need adequate amounts of sleep. Um, when somebody comes to you with that, do you have a recommendation or some sort of um, concrete system that you'll pass and, along to them? So if if someone doesn't sleep as much and are looking for ways to either mitigate the damage from not sleeping or how to sleep more? Um, let's start with if somebody just is not going to get the recommended amount of sleep. And we'll get to that, whatever that number is later. Okay. They're just not going to get it. Um, yeah. Kids, job. It happens. Whatever yeah. it happens, right? So yeah. somebody is listening to this and be like, okay, cool story, Jesse. You can sleep however many hours you want a night. Yeah. Um, but I can't. I got kids. They're getting up in the middle of the night. Um, I got to get them ready for school before I go to work. I have a two-hour commute. Whatever, Whatever is going on that is out of their control at this point in time, right. what can they do to to mitigate the negative effects of that. So one of the most important things for this is controlling that blood sugar. So even a single night, this has been shown in several papers. So even a single night of missing out on sleep. So one night where you get five hours of sleep, you miss out on those additional, a, a lot of these negative side effects seem to happen below six hours. That's not to say six hours is enough on a regular basis. No, absolutely not. But in terms of these acute negative side effects, ones that you'll experience immediately the next day, it seems to be below six hours. That kind of seems to be the uh, kind of the important number. And maybe that is because, I mean, on average, your sleep cycles run about 90 minutes. So if you're getting six hours, you're getting that extra sleep cycle in there. But if you're dipping below that down into five hours, you're missing out on an entire sleep cycle. And that seems to be the cutoff. But anyways, I digress. So the most important thing is this blood sugar control, because if you miss out on sleep just one single night, your insulin sensitivity for the next day is essentially takes a significant dip in efficiency. So what I mean by that is normally if you are insulin sensitive, that means the carbohydrates you consume will be quickly and efficiently actually stored as energy. If you're insulin resistant, then you will, you're more likely to store this as fat. So, and you can kind of, you have to picture this on a continuum. It's not you're insulin sensitive and then all of a sudden you're insulin resistance. This happens along a continuum and you could be anywhere in between there, but the closer you get to insulin resistance, that's of course closer to type two diabetes, but then all of these negative health consequences along with it happen as you progress along that continuum. So, Back to the sleep deprivation, you can imagine that on this continuum, if you miss out on those hours, you're kind of for that next day, you're bumped up on that continuum. So you're closer to insulin resistance. So that means that we have to take steps that following day or the days after sleep deprivation in order to kind of mitigate this damage. So the biggest thing for doing this would be to, especially in the first half of the day, avoid those high sugar foods avoid those processed foods, the processed carbohydrates. We want to keep insulin levels low because that maintains insulin sensitivity. And so that means that we're going to be prioritizing the healthy fats and proteins at this time. And then later on in the day, if again, if your activity level is high enough um, the day before that day, the next day, then you would begin to introduce carbohydrates. But even then, even then you would want to avoid those, those carbohydrates that cause a sharp increase in your blood sugar. So 
we can call these, these have a couple different names, kind of the ones with like the high glycemic index, the high insulin index. So just to give people an example, that could be like, obviously any dessert, like a muffin, a donut, chocolate bar, and then anything that's really high in sugar. So even like, even some of the fruits out there wouldn't be your best option. Like a brown spotted banana has much higher sugar than just a regular yellow or green banana, um, things like dates. And then even like back to the fruit, like a pineapple or something like that, that's really high in sugar. So that's one very important one would be to control the blood sugar. Um, another important one would actually be to exercise, but again, this would not be the time to kind of go for that, that marathon run or that two hour workout or whatever it may be. This is a time to keep it brief, shorter than normal. Cause again, you're, you've already increased your stress meter by not sleeping. Your cortisol is probably already higher than usual. So you just kind of want to mitigate that with the minimal amount of exercise required. And to be honest, this doesn't require much. It can be as little as something like even like a, a 10 to 20 minute hit session would be sufficient to, again, move you back down that continuum closer to being insulin sensitive for the rest of the day. And it has actually been shown that just a single exercise session when you are sleep deprived can um, restore your insulin sensitivity for those sleep deprived days. So obviously not everyone's going to have these optimal conditions where you get that eight, even nine hours sleep. Sleep deprivation is a real thing. For some people, unfortunately, it's pretty regular. And so it's all about um, mitigating these risks and kind of, kind of optimizing the conditions that we've been given. Yeah. Right on. Some people, you just get stuck. You can't, <clears throat> yeah. you can't do anything yeah. about it. And that's, that's tough. Um, but the sounds of things, it's, um, it goes back to the old eat well and move your body. Yeah. To help mitigate Just the most simple things really. Yeah. And I think that don't eat stuff that was made in a factory a month ago. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or longer for sure. It always comes back to that. And somehow people are always still amazed or surprised. Like, yeah. Oh, that is able to fix that. Like it's like, but check my body. Needed that? <laughs> I want something completely obscure and crazy. Yeah. That I have to do. Like a crazy pill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, it's just that simple. Um, I next week Monday I have like a red eye flight from London, Ontario yes. to London, England. Yep. Um, so I was talking with Doctor Joel at the gym, and he gave me the exact same recommendations that you just gave to everybody because that night I'm not going to sleep very well. Right. We fly out in the evening on Monday night, like nine ish. I think we get to London, England at 11 a.m. local time for them. So best thing to do to fight the jet lag is just to stay up. Right. You got to stay yeah, up, definitely. go to bed at a normal time and try to be as normal as possible. Yeah. But the recommendation was and what you were just mentioning when you're talking about that sleep deprived person on more of a chronic is that you stick to like low carbohydrate more fats, more proteins through that day. Stay away from all the processed foods. If you miss out on a little bit, for me, calories are important for my performance and I yep. like to keep track of that stuff. But if I miss out on a couple hundred calories or a little bit more than that, because I'm not getting as much carbohydrates in, it's like, just let, let it go. Right. Yeah. And then the next day go back to normal. So, but that's very acute. And I don't think that's not the norm, right? It's not, it's right. not the norm that some people just only sleep two, three hours a night every once in a while. Um, yeah. It's more of like a chronic due to and, schedule. And sometimes the acute can even be, well, not if we're talking sleep deprivation, but in terms of messing up your sleep cycle, sometimes that acute can be even more challenging than the long term. So, what I mean by that is someone on shift work who just randomly goes in and works, you know, throughout the night, two or three days a week versus someone who's able to do that for two or three months on end, that acute one's going to be much more difficult to deal with than the other one. And we talked a little bit about this last time, but it's because you never get a chance to adapt to that, that new schedule. You're always flipping back and forth and it's impossible to deal with. But in terms of the sleep deprivation, 
obviously missing that as little as possible is the best case. Yeah. What should people be aiming for in terms of sleep, like hours? Um, so there is a, most of the research kind of shows that that eight hour mark is the, is kind of the cutoff where a getting less than eight hours for a long period of time is what can lead to the health risks. And then getting above eight hours is kind of that optimal level. But that being said, so you mentioned earlier that every once in a while, you'll have someone kind of come up to you and say, Oh, I sleep five, six hours a night. So, and then they they follow that with, Oh, that's all I need. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's usual comment. So there is, I'm not saying those are these people. It's probably not these people because the, the gene variant I'm about to tell you about is extremely rare. I can't give you a percentage, but there is a variant that allows people to sleep less and actually recover and restore the same amount as they normally would with more sleep. So they say that, yeah, it's very interesting. They say that some of the, this is what some of the presidents had because they would, you know, they would sleep what four hours a night and kind of just function and be fine throughout the day. They get up and then, do whatever you have to do if you're the president. I don't fucking know. Imagine <laughs> yeah. it's pretty busy. <laughs> yeah, but for sure. My guess is the majority of people do not have this. If you sleep that long and you feel tired, yeah, you need more. Yeah. So anyways, back to, yeah, so eight hours. But there's kind of a few different different tricks you can use if you don't get that eight hours. So I would say seven, seven and a half hours is a nice number if you don't think you can get to eight hours because Because again, if we go back to those 90 minute sleep cycles from six to seven and a half hours is one extra sleep cycle. And then if you're going from seven and a half to eight hours, it's like, you know, you might not be missing out on all that much. Um, So sometimes I'll do this just because that's what I do. I kind of, I kind of like to hack these things and read into the science more than most people would, but I'll usually go from, you know, sleeping either seven and a half or nine hours. Sometimes it's, I'll go in between, but it's just things I like to experiment with. And then interestingly, unless you are kind of sleep deprived and have had some of those nights where you're sleeping four five, six hours, whatever it may be, sleeping over about nine hours actually isn't beneficial. And in some cases it becomes detrimental to sleep too long. So I thought that was really interesting too, when I saw that. But the main thing is with sleep, like we have to remember that there's all these different repair mechanisms that are going on also. And we talked about this as well. If you're not fasted, when you go into sleep, you lose out on a lot of these repair mechanisms. And these are the things that over time contribute to those health risks. So even, even looking at the brain, it's been shown that if you have long-term sleep deprivation, you'll have an elevated risk for Alzheimer's disease because there's there's like this brainwash that takes place overnight where we get kind of this, essentially this cleaning fluid goes through our brain and kind of rinses out all the old cellular garbage that we accumulate. It's sort of like a cellular detox that we get every single night. So this is um, operated by something called the glymphatic system. And they've found that long-term sleep deprivation, if you lose out on this, you could have an elevated risk for Alzheimer's disease because you're not clearing out all those old, old damaged cells that kind of um, start to form for Alzheimer's disease that can start to form um, beta amyloid and some of these other protein aggregates. Um, so I digress again, <laughs> but I hope that gives an explanation of, yeah. kind of the importance of sleep. <clears throat> yeah. And it's effect on your, hormones yeah yeah i guess i didn't talk too much about the hormones but yeah yeah so like uh, i mentioned like one of those things that you're missing out on if you're not going into a sleep fasted and i don't mean like don't eat you know for three four five hours before bed i just mean it's not really ideal on a regular basis to eat that snack immediately before you go to bed because then you are missing out on um, secretion of human growth hormone while you sleep so human growth hormone, most of us have heard of this because it's in, abused in sports. That's because it's important for repair of tissue throughout the whole body. So bones, ligaments, connective tissue, um, even healing your gut lining. That's where HGH is responsible for all of this. And of course, like promoting muscle growth and repair. 
So that's one thing that, again, we miss out on sleep deprived. We miss out on if we're kind of not preparing properly for sleep. So that's another one of those examples where young Timmy who wants to become a bodybuilder comes to you and is like, been sleeping five, six hours a night so that I can get up extra early and train and then have extra time to get a second training session in later in the day. Well, it's like, bro, it's not in the gym where you're actually building this muscle. It's, it's while you sleep. It's while you recover. It's during these off days. Yeah. That's another concept that people <clears throat> often forget. And I think that's where the cortisol issue comes back in. Mm -hmm. We're definitely in a culture and it's shifting now, but CrossFit was very much in a culture of like, um, more and more and more and more and more. Totally. Right? Yeah. If I'm not good at this, then I'm just going to do more and more of that, but also do more of all the other things that I'm already decently yeah. good at. And it just became, um, well, it becomes a full-time job of training for people, people training six. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying in the gym for six hours, I mean, physically training their bodies to get better at their sport for six hours. And it's nice that we're starting to see a shift to the less is more. Yeah. And it's just more about quality um, and more about taking yeah. care of your body so that your body can actually adapt to the training that That's you're doing. Right, yeah. Right. Like you need to allow that adaptation to occur. Those are what rest days are for and what deloads are for. Yeah. Um, and I think that is probably why that that is likely why this whole concept of cortisol and adrenal fatigue. So I do that with quotation marks has become so popular maybe because there was that period of time where like you said crossfit was go 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 these people just blew up and so mm -hmm. eventually people learned and kind of the awareness is now out there yeah so our hormones in exercise yeah okay we've kind of talked a lot about like sleep sleep is important i think that's why we automatically went to that is because i agree that has to be in check first before we even discuss the idea of regulating yeah. hormones or having an understanding around how your hormones are affected by that's training right, yeah if you're not even it's like fixing your doorknob when you got a crack in your foundation <laughs> like really you're not gonna you're not gonna make any gains in the gym if you're not sleeping yeah it looks good that's <laughs> yeah that's right that's, that's true and unfortunately it looks I think... good on instagram you can post the video yeah it's like your doorknob looks good from the outside but does it even, what's inside? Is there anything inside? Yeah. You just open the door and it's like an episode of Hoarders. You got 14 dead <laughs> yeah. cats in your house. Like <laughs> we, we got to start, we yeah. got, you know what I mean? Like you got to work inside first. That's right. Yeah. Um, so let's talk, how can we start this conversation? Maybe around um, the hormonal response from like an aerobic training session or something yeah like a sure longer duration so when we're talking aerobic we're talking like a, a low to moderate level of intensity right you could scale that any way you want to whether you're tracking heart rate yeah. or perceived exertion or um pacing if right. you have experience with right. pacing on running or pacing on rowing or something like that 20 minutes typically or more Hey guys, I interrupt today's podcast for a very quick announcement. Jesse and I are still working on sponsorships for the podcast. If you'd be interested in sponsoring the Fitness Experiment podcast, please let us know. For today, how about a shameless plug for the two businesses behind the podcast? Sheriff's Performance Academy provides high-level athletes and recreational athletes with customized training programs. This is not your cookie cutter program that you download from the internet. As a client of Jesse's, I can attest to the care and the detail that he puts into these programs. They're constantly fluctuating based on your individual goals, needs, and progress. So if you're looking to become a beast in the gym, on the ice, on the field, Jesse's your guy. Brain Ignition provides athletes, and health conscious individuals with nutrition plus programs. This plus indicates that these programs are designed to fit your specific needs. So most programs fail because they are too generic. So I'll track your athletic performance, your stress, your heart rate variability, even blood biomarkers. And then based on this, prescribe different nutrition. So different macronutrients, supplements, and recovery techniques. So the goal is simple. It's to improve 
energy, performance, and overall brain health. So if you have some specific goals in mind, I'd love to help you reach these. Now, back to the podcast. I hope you enjoy the second half. Right. Seemingly forever. Um, we know that energy systems are on a, a dimmer switch. Yep. So for you and I sitting here right now, our aerobic system is doing most of the work providing energy for our bodies. Yep. So for that type of exercise, what goes on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happens? So it, we do have to emphasize that the, the response to whether it be resistance training or, as you said, kind of in quotations, cardio, because there's a hundred different ty- types of cardio. Right. It's definitely completely different. Now, if we look at kind of the just the cardio in general as a whole, I'm not familiar with a lot of work that actually separates kind of the different, the different adaptations that occur based on um, the level of intensity. Now, obviously there's, we know the difference between, you know, we know the difference between aerobic and aerobic. We know kind of what those different adaptations are, but in terms of the actual kind of, the hormonal profile and like where exactly on that continuum of, in, of intensity it changes. We don't really know, but that being said, of course, with any type of cardio work, regardless of the intensity or more than likely, we're going to have that initial elevation of cortisol. So that's, that's a no bueno, no brainer or no bueno. I think both of those would work there, <laughs> but so yeah, that's, that's happens. That's going to happen regardless. Because that's that, that's that fight or flight response. That's that stress response. So anytime you, anytime you get that heart rate elevated, we get that release of epinephrine, norepinephrine. We're getting a secretion of cortisol. All of these things are mobilizing our energy stores. So the epinephrine is acting on our stored glycogen. It's releasing that into the blood as glucose. That's what's energizing us. Cortisol has these similar actions. It's mobilizing us to, again, thinking in terms of survival, it's mobilizing us to survive. So the sweat, the elevated heart rate, kind of the dilation of the pupils, all these things are happening um, regardless of the type of cardio. Now, sort of the thing about, I guess, cortisol and cardio. So let's first look at Let's first look at kind of the traditional, we'll call it steady state cardio. Sure. So for people not familiar, this is sort of the idea of, it's just when you, when you go into a a gold's gym and you see people plugging away on the treadmill, just at a steady state for 45 minutes, upwards of say two hours. Yeah. You set the treadmill to like four and a half miles. Yeah, exactly. Watch TV and cruise. Yeah. So this would, this would be our. This would be our steady state. Now, this one's interesting because there is a lot of, there's a lot of possible side effects of doing this on a regular basis that are largely related to our hormones. And one of the reason being is because we have that chronic elevation in cortisol. So you're jacking up that cortisol when you start, when you start that run and that cortisol usually stays high for a longer period of time after that level of exertion. So you can imagine if you're doing that for, you know, consistently every single day, you have that cortisol jacked up all the time. If you're not, if you're not adapted to that. So if you didn't initially slowly build up to that as say like a professional would, and you just started running constantly every single day, this is where you can get that kind of that skinny fat, So we, again, we mentioned that if you have high levels of cortisol, you're more likely to store body fat as like a survival mechanism. And then once you have that, once you have that increase in body fat and you keep running, keep doing that dreaded steady state cardio, I don't know how people do it. You're not dropping any weight because it's like a, it's a vicious cycle by that point because even once you accumulate all of this added tissue and have an abundance of that adipose tissue, it, this is where it gets interesting. It can then actually create its own cortisol. So it's like your fat tissue is part of your endocrine system. 
it's part of your it's it's essentially it's it's its own organ which is wild and so it releases its own cortisol and then kind of this is where that whole concept of quotations adrenal fatigue comes in because you're releasing this cortisol from your fat tissue but because it's coming from your fat tissue and not your adrenals like yes there is still some come coming from your adrenals but your increased cortisol is coming now from your fat tissue your brain doesn't recognize that it just it recognizes that cortisol that's coming from the adrenal glands and so it'll just kind of you know keep going so there's sort of a disconnect between those two systems and this is where some of those problems begin to arise so where were we now so like if we so let's kind of tone back the or pardon me let's tone up the intensity a little bit so if we now look at kind of those short bursts of kind of high intense um aerobic activity so maybe that's like a high intensity interval session where you're doing just for an example maybe like one minute hard three minutes off Mm -hmm. and you do that a couple maybe even a couple times a week i think this is this is where we sort of start to um kind of move back towards the hormonal response to resistance training. So it's almost like an intermediate Um, because this can actually have beneficial effects on cortisol now. So those high intense sessions will have that, will have that initial elevation in cortisol. This persists throughout the training session, but it's after the training session in the hours after, and then in many days after that, it would actually be lower compared to beforehand. So that's a little bit confusing. So kind of to sum that up. So if you measured someone's cortisol week zero, before they start this high intense, high intensity exercise during that session, yes, of course, the cortisol is going to peak, it's going to increase. But then if you keep that high intensity up for a consistent period of time, so maybe you do that, um, you know, even like three times a week for say three weeks after that, you measure the cortisol after that three week training session, your baseline cortisol just throughout the day is going to be lower than it was before you started that session. So this is where it can have beneficial effects on kind of that stress response. This is why they say exercise can reduce your anxiety, stress, that type of thing. But again, if you're doing that every single day, same thing, you're going to burn out. You're not going to lose any fat. You're going to start to accumulate more and more fat. And then it's going to throw some of your other hormones out of whack that whether you're male or female, it's going to throw out some testosterone, some estrogen, you're going to have elevation and inflammation, that sort of thing. So if we stick with that kind of that high intensity interval stuff, There has been some stuff to show that you need that level of intensity to get certain benefits. So some studies have shown that to get that beneficial effect on cortisol, you need that level of intensity. Others have shown that to get um, an adequate, not an adequate, like a a significant, so a measurable amount of release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So this is a growth factor that leads to growth of new neurons and synapses in the brain. It's been shown that you need that level of high intensity in order to actually get that benefit. So when they compare that to a lower intensity, those people just didn't have the same, excuse me, the same release of BDNF. So there is definitely some major differences, even when we just look at, you know, in quotations, the different categories of um, cardio. And the, and there's probably, there's probably hundreds of other scenarios where these intensities and modalities differ, but there's just, we just don't know. It just hasn't been looked at. Yeah. From a fitness perspective, I'm going to talk about, um, I have a big beef with this. The beef is that, um, some fitness professionals, some fitness facilities use high intensity interval training slash CrossFit style training interchangeably as the same thing. And then also 
advertise themselves as like a, a fat burning gym or like a fat burning focus, whatever. <clears throat> and they're lying to people and they're lying to people because what they're doing <clears throat> is they're, they're programming or um, the style of their fitness is that's advertised as high intensity interval training is an hour long. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? That's a you know long I mean? time, like, yeah. Come on. Let's be let's be honest right now. Could you run at a high intensity for an hour straight? If you say yes, you're a liar. Yeah. Those are two completely different things. Even I think it was like two weeks ago, this guy broke the marathon world record, just smashed it. I saw and that. his pace was ridiculous. Yeah. That's not high intensity for that no, dude. No. He ran it for hours. Right? That's not a high intensity. Okay. Those are two completely different things. So these people are lying to people saying that you're going to come in, we're going to do 30 seconds on 30 seconds off or like a minute on a minute <laughs> off through this cycle <laughs> of bullshit. And then you're going to come out the other side and you're going to have fat burning effects for the rest of the day. Sure. It's like, fuck <laughs> off. You know, it's so annoying yeah. because what with that duration, so energy system training has four components. Essentially there's going to be the, um, the person themselves. Okay. So that, that person, their, um, their age, their gender, um, their body composition, their training age, which is separate from their biological age, all those things, their environment, all that stuff. And then the three that we can program for being the modality, the intensity, and the duration. If you are programming a long duration workout, advertising at high intensity, you're lying. You can't maintain that yeah (laughs) intensity for that amount of time basically is what i'm saying so these in lying to these people you're doing them a disservice and you're affecting their health on the level that you're just talking about they're doing a lot of work but is that more of a steady state or like a i'm kind of gonna go hard but i know that i have to do this for another 58 minutes so i'm not gonna go that hard pace and that's causing them to store more fat and then their fat is having an effect on their hormones and it's just a vicious cycle. They come back and then they get the same thing over and over and over again. So the point of my rant is that as a consumer, like you're a fitness, you're a health and fitness consumer when you're listening to this podcast and when you're out in the world, you can't trust people all the time. You need to find professionals that are going to be straight up honest with you and not give you what you want all the time because what you want all the time isn't necessarily what you need. So to go back to those people that are coming to me and be like, I want more. It's like, no, if you choose to go off on your own and do more, that's on you. I'm going to tell you right now that I don't want you to do that because I care about you and I want you to get better. But if you choose to go and do that, this is what's going to happen. You're going to put yourself in this cycle and in this loop of never seeing any body composition changes. And that's from a health perspective, right? From a sport perspective, those are two. Those are, that's completely different conversation, right? If you're training for a, an ultra marathon or, or some very crazy, yeah, like a very enduring event that are hours and hours on end, you need to train your body yep. to work up to that sort of duration, and that's completely separate. There's a on that continuum. If it's a U shape, upside down U, a rainbow sort of setup, we're going from that health and wellness and we're kind of on our way down it's more of like a, a sick yeah state you're not yeah. doing this for health you're doing it for sports so that's a completely different conversation yes, sure. but if you're coming to me and you're looking for body composition changes then we have to train that appropriately and effectively and i think that's by doing probably what we're going to talk about next in terms of hormones is more of like the resistance training yeah, response and how that. that differs from the longer duration things yeah. And why strength training um, can and should be a priority for everyone. Yeah. Whether there's Let's focus in sport or health. Uh, I had one other thing I just wanted to touch on there that you yeah. reminded me of. <clears throat> now I forget what it was. <laughs> yeah, I get it though. Like the, the wanting the more volume, wanting more work. I totally get it. It's, it's hard, especially, especially when you're a competing athlete and you don't, you're not aware of these potential side effects. It's like, 
come on, like exercise is good for me. Why, why can't I just do more and get better? Yeah. It's good to a point until it's not yeah. right. Like people that train, <clears throat> train for a sport, they're trained to get better at their sport and there may be a risk to their health in right. order to do that. Right. Health isn't the priority for that person. It's, um, winning a championship yeah. or qualifying or whatever, whatever it is. I'm convinced now that I definitely had some, some symptoms or some kind of underlying physiology to this concept of overtraining or what many people call nowadays adrenal fatigue. So I'm convinced that that's what me training too often, not recovering was what eventually led to a back injury. But if you would have told me that at the time, I'd be like, like, there's no possible way. Yeah. I just worked out. How could that possibly lead to a back injury? But it's just this, it's just this concept of you're accumulating all this inflammation when you train. So this is another response that we get. We're getting an accumulation of these pro-inflammatory cytokines again, necessary. So these are molecules that are released in order to kind of mobilize the immune system. So this is part of the necessary response to exercise necessary to the, um, or pardon me, necessary to get that beneficial adaptation. But if you constantly have those levels of inflammation laying around, guess what? You're going to get some damage to some of your tissue. If you have some tissue that's already vulnerable. So mine was probably I had um, some disc degeneration, so that was probably already vulnerable. I had all these levels of inflammation laying around, and it just kind of, just kind of gave me that little nudge that you know popped that disc and promoted that injury. Mm-hmm. But if I would have, if I would have played it safe and dialed back that volume and had the recovery, took some days off, maybe that wouldn't have happened. Who knows? But again, if you would have told me that at that time, mm-hmm. there's no way. Yeah, it's hard to let go of that. Yeah. For sure, especially when you're training for a sport. <clears throat> That's right, not, yeah. You're not, health isn't always yeah. on the forefront of what you're thinking about. Yeah. But. Yeah, so if we now if we go back to resistance training, so definitely some major differences in terms of the hormonal response, <laughs> which obviously, I mean, look at look at how resistance training makes you look compared to chronic running. You kind of, on one, one hand you have skinny body, no muscle, cause that's what's most ad- advantageous for your body. Mm-hmm. It doesn't want to carry around a bunch of muscle. If you're just running every single day, mm-hmm. it's not very energetically efficient. And then on the other hand, obviously muscular. So resistance training, we do get again, this, big elevation in human growth hormone. So that is one thing that can last for many hours um, after that single resistance training session. So that's why they say that just one session you can benefit for, excuse me, several hours or a day later, because this HGH is hanging around for a long time, that elevation. So you're getting a repair to all these tissues, all these joints, ligaments, and so on. And then of course, testosterone is a big one. So we will get an increased release of testosterone. Now this is true for both men and women, women, pardon me. Um, I think this is, I think it's underappreciated, but again, all you have to do is look at Olympians, high level sports, women have used testosterone too, right? Mm. It's a primary anabolic hormone. So in order to build muscle, you need testosterone. That's why people inject testosterone in their butt because it (laughs) increases their muscle growth. So that's again, obviously beneficial. Um, and it's beneficial for again, women as well, not just men having these healthy levels of testosterone important for sexual function. Um, many women will report improvements to, not only overall well-being, but even to their cycles. So their menstrual cycles just from resistance training. And it probably has a lot to do with these, um, this testosterone they're getting and just the effect that has on their hormones in general. So regulating estrogen, that type of thing. And just as a side note, I was talking to Jesse about this earlier that I've kind of been doing more digging into 
the specifics on um, hormonal health among women. I did find some interesting stuff showing that women who suddenly begin resistance training or strength training, they have kind of, they have improvements or increases in their breast tissue. So actually, I guess we could call it like a breast enlargement. And I don't think it's just from increasing the size of your pec underneath that's pushing your breasts out farther. It's apparently the actual recomposition of your breast tissue. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I don't think many people would be aware of that one. Yeah. If anything, people will probably think the opposite. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And then the other huge advantage <clears throat> from resistance training, which is probably, which is, um, pardon me, probably the most beneficial thing of resistance training compared to most forms of, um, quote unquote cardio is we get a huge improvement to insulin sensitivity. So back to that continuum, you get bumped back down the continuum closer to being insulin sensitive. So that's very, very beneficial. And you do actually get, um, you'll get a movement of receptors for glucose from, um, to the outside of your muscle cells. So essentially what that means is um, whenever you eat kind of um, a carbohydrate food or something high in sugar after a weight training session, basically that goes in your bloodstream. And then as soon as it passes by one of these muscle cells, since all of these transporters have moved to the outside of the cell, it'll just suck that sugar up like a sponge. So that's why they say um, you can kind of get away with eating some, I don't want to say crappy foods, but you can certainly get away with eating quite a few carbohydrates after a heavy strength training session. And that's going to be put to build muscle as opposed to being uh, put towards fat. And so these, this is another benefit that'll hang around for a while. So again, if you're doing that consistently, wouldn't even have to be on a daily basis. If you can get that improvement to insulin sensitivity, that's huge for overall health. Certainly. Right on. I really want to clear up resistance training, <clears throat> man. And it's the way it's being used here because I think resistance, it's another one of those things that just gets stretched out and made into something that it's not and really confuses people because they're just being misled. Um, I don't know. I'm going to say it, whatever, you know, your body pump, <laughs> the body pump class yeah. where you have like a barbell in your hand. And you're moving a barbell, you're moving a weighted object <clears throat> continuously for an hour. It's not resistance training. No. Not in this context. <clears throat> um, weight lifting in a CrossFit workout or weight lifting for time, barbell cycling. <clears throat> not the resistance training we're talking about. Mm -hmm. We're talking about <clears throat> moving a weight that relative to your maximum effort that you can lift in that, let's pick a squat. Okay. So relative to the heaviest back squat that you could do, um, your intensity is relatively high. So relatively high being like 60% or above for a controlled amount of volume, whether it be like 50 reps in a, in a workout or five reps in a workout. It's controlled intensity, it's controlled volume, and it's controlled rest. So we're working at a higher intensity level. Comparing it back to our conditioning stuff, we created a distinction between our aerobic training and our anaerobic training or that high-intensity interval training. And if the high-intensity interval training is done properly, the intensity is controlled and the rest is controlled and the modality, so the movements that you're doing, are controlled that you can work at a higher percentage relative to your maximum effort for that amount of time. And that is controlled as well. Yeah. Okay. So that it can't, we can't blur those lines. They have to be very, very clear. And people need to understand that. So that when they're choosing the exercise program or routine or facility that they're going to be going to, that they're picking one that matches with their goals. And I'm not saying it has to be one way or another i'm saying that you have to make sure that you're picking the right thing for you so if your goal is to have the effects the hormone responses that chet just talked about from resistance training then you need to do proper resistance training you can't do a pseudo um cardio blast high yeah. intensity 
training session yeah, and expect the same results because you were picking up something that was yeah. weighted. Okay, that's not that's not the definition we're using here. So yeah, I think the 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 real resistance <clears throat> training that you're talking about that that heavy load, I think that's kind of greatly underappreciated for mm-hmm. overall health. Not even just in terms of the hormonal responses, but it'd be cool to get someone who someone like a, you know, like a chiropractor or someone in here just to explain like the importance of even just building your glutes, like your glutes right. are like just the foundation of your entire body. Like they support your spine. They support your lower extremities. If you don't have strong glutes, then guess what? You're probably going to have sore hips, low mm-hmm. back pain, sore knees, and people just don't appreciate that. I think there's, there's a huge, for some reason, there's like a fear amongst a large number of people, especially older individuals who have never weight trained before. There's a huge fear about lifting heavy things, doing heavy squats, heavy deadlifts, that type mm-hmm. of thing. There was a main, like a major media thing that just put out a recommendation that people over 50 don't squat, deadlift, pull up or push up. Yep. And I'm like, and which is like, what? yeah, <clears throat> like, foundational movements to being a human right like yeah you need to be able to pick stuff up you need to be able to climb up something you can do squats deadlifts push-ups and pull-ups up up until 49 and 364 years old oh hells yeah (laughs) as soon as you hit 50 shut it down you're done you're done forever you can't touch anything don't pick up your groceries bogus um yeah don't pick yourself if you fall down just stay there you're done you're dead just give up on life. You're 50 years old. It's so terrible. Yeah, it's the worst advice it ever. And it's, it's awful. The problem is, unfortunately, a lot of people take what the news tells us as the truth. Oh, God. Yeah. In the first the place. Pet peeve right. So, like, time. just from like a political, I mean, weather. It's like, like whatever the 6 this PM news. Yeah. This yeah. box tells me yeah. that that's what's actually happening. So, when people see that, they're like, oh, well, whatever news. I don't know what it was. I'd call them out if I remember it because I don't. Global news or something, probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whatever it was, puts this thing up, and my grandma sees it, and she's like, oh, well, I can hurt my back. Yeah. I'm like, oh, my God. Right? <clears throat> I guess the point, I don't even know what the point of that rant was. I don't either, right. but I think it's oh. important to talk about. <clears throat> the important to talk about as people training. get older. Yeah. Yeah. And the- Let's just start up another. <clears throat> Yeah, someone. old people deadlifting, doing resistance training. Yeah, yeah. Or people in general being afraid of resistance training for fear of injury. Yes. Yeah. Or for fear of thing. getting you bulky. See that a lot. Or getting too big. It's funny, like if someone has a sore back or chronic back pain and they've never lifted heavy weights before, they think that that's a reason not to do it. Mm. See, yeah, it is weird. Um, so sorry to just, I guess if we talk, kind of link the cortisol back to some resistance training, I don't think I mentioned too much cortisol in that kind of rambling answer. Yeah, no, not, not with the resistance training. (laughs) But, um, so an important part to actually building muscle after that resistance training session would be to actually decrease cortisol as quickly as possible. So when you consume that post-workout protein shake, maybe you have some added carbs. If you're, this is kind of a separate subject, but if you're lean enough for carbs post-workout, um, the carbohydrates actually, they do also act as an anti-inflammatory agent. So they'll release, or pardon me, they'll reduce some of those pro-inflammatory cytokines that we accumulate during exercise, but they'll also um, immediately reduce cortisol. So this is why... This is why a lot of people will self-medicate with carbohydrates. It makes them feel better. That's part of the reason because it lowers cortisol. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the important things to do after exercise. Because if you have that cortisol hang around for a long period of time after training, your body thinks you're stressed. So it's not going to put all this added energy into building muscle, right? If you're surviving, you don't suddenly need to, well, some may argue that, but you don't suddenly need to put immediate resources into building muscle. Right. Right. You need to put immediate resources into getting the hell out of there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think there's definitely uh, resistance training is a tough one to um, get people on board with some in some cases. Um, whereas the aerobic stuff or the long, slow, steady state stuff seems to be a bit of an easier mm-hmm. conversation um, in the general public, yeah. just a little bit. And I think to clear this up, I mean, we are by no means bashing cardio, aerobic exercise. Mm-hmm. That's great. And I personally think <clears throat> that, I think that there is something very unique about going for a run because it's kind of something, it's something very, very primal kind of, and the, and the run, if it is a run has to be outside in order for this to make sense. What I'm saying, it can't be on a treadmill. It's kind of that, it's that proprioception. So you're feeling kind of the changes in the ground that you're running on. You're kind of, you're taking in the scenario. So as you run, your eyes are seeing all these different scenarios or pardon me, all these different um, sceneries, whatever it may be, the trees, the buildings, mm-hmm. all that kind of thing. It's taking all of this in at one time. Your brain is kind of integrating all of that. I think there's something to be said about running just because, and just because of how it makes you feel afterwards. Like, I don't know about you, but there is kind of this bizarre kind of Zen like feeling that I get after running that I don't necessarily always get after even like resistance training. Do you feel that? Same yeah. Way? Yeah. Totally. That runner's high or the, yeah. that little buzz. Totally. <clears throat> it's definitely a real thing. Yeah. Definitely not bashing any type of fitness for sure. Bashing people not being truthful and honest with people yeah. and ending up costing them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's definitely what I, we were bashing. I was bashing was yeah. the lying. As long as we have the clear understanding of the different types and then how to properly fuel and recover from those things. Everything's yeah golden. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. I think you kind of nailed it with the, the runner's high feeling, obviously there's a big benefit to um, conditioning on it and the aerobic training on just an emotional level. Yeah. Right. Like having that connection with stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, A lot of people will channel that in different ways. They'll channel it by um, going hiking with friends or walking their dog. You're doing the same thing. It's just not maybe as formal. Right. And it doesn't have to be formal. That style of exercise does not have to be formal. It doesn't have to be an hour long um, kind of circuit that you go through at the gym for recovery. Yeah. I do a lot of like 60 minute AMRAPs at an easy effort for people as a recovery session. The goal of that session is that feeling that you got. Yeah. And to get the blood moving and to get your body moving and to, coming off a rest day or coming off a time away from the gym to help with that little reset, right? Get, yeah, get us absolutely. back a little bit. So the benefits are there. I would love it if, if people did it all outside of the gym, Yeah, that stuff doesn't, you don't have to spend time in the gym to get that stuff done. Yeah. It's funny. <laughs> I always laugh when you see people. So you're at a gym. Let's use gold's gym. It's nice to pick on the franchise like that. <laughs> yeah. You show up and you see people trying to find the closest parking spot possible to the door <laughs> only to go inside and walk on stationary treadmill for 60 minutes while they watch reruns of Oprah. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty odd. I feel like doing that, you're missing out on a lot of the benefits of aerobic training. Totally. Yeah. I think yeah. You're, you're so overstimulated um, yeah. or understimulated, right? I guess it depends on what you look at. I agree. How you look at it. Yeah. It could be. You're overstimulated because there's all the lights and the gadgets and the buttons and you got your headphones in yep. and you're watching TV. Um, but you're understimulated because you're not getting what you should actually be getting out of that, which is a time to, totally. since it's not a higher intensity. And if you're like, oh, but Jesse, like that is higher intensity for me. It's like, well, you're doing it wrong. That's not, yeah, that's not the aerobic then. training that we're talking about, right? Again, I want to create a very distinct line there. This aerobic training is at an intensity and a duration that you feel comfortable the entire time. And if you're not enjoying the modality that you're doing it in, you don't enjoy running, you don't enjoy hiking or biking or mountain biking or whatever, 
find something else and do that yeah. because you can do it in different ways. You don't have to run. That's right. You can yeah. walk and get the, get a similar response. I'm sure right? that's, it'd be interesting to see, to compare the, you know, the differences in the neurochemical response between someone who's exercising, but doing a type of exercise they thoroughly enjoy versus someone who's doing maybe the same exact same type of exercise, but they despise it. So they do that at the same intensity, that same amount of crazy. time. I wonder what the difference would be. That'd be awesome. There'd have to, there'd definitely be some differences, even just yeah. based on like placebo. Yeah. Yeah. It's placebo alone, how powerful that is. Yeah. But yeah, I think you, you hit on a good point. I think regardless the importance or the most important thing is probably variability. Mm -hmm. I think that's why CrossFit is so cool is because it is constantly varied. Yeah. I think there's, there's something to be said definitely about doing all these things we mentioned kind of in an integrated program. So, mm -hmm. and that's what you do with your clients. So, and this is why, this is why people need a professional like Jesse to actually put these things together because having a professional put them together will actually mean that you're actually benefiting from it, not breaking yourself down. Because there's so many different components, it's hard to figure out, you know, how the hell do I combine all these things? But I think that's, you know, combining the, maybe the long run, maybe once a week, twice a week, depending on who you are, you combine that with like a, a heavy deadlift day, maybe some heavy pull-ups, that type of thing. Another day, maybe you're doing some high intensity intervals, you know, like 400 meter sprints around a track or something like that. And to be honest, that's it, like minimum requirement you could probably do one aerobic session, one heavy strength training session and one hit session and like, boom, you're golden. If that's, if that's all you want, then yeah, that's all it takes. And you do that consistently over time. Yeah. You're going to see the benefits. Take care from. of everything else away from the mm -hmm. field, if you mm -hmm. will. And yeah, I think you're golden, but yeah, definitely that, that idea of constantly varied is yeah. important. And as a foundation for CrossFit and functional fitness is a high intensity portion too. Yeah. That is relative, right? High intensity for a one rep max deadlift or high intensity for this aerobic condition that we're talking about are, yeah. are two very, very different things. Um, yes. But the intensity is where you get the adaptation and the, the appropriate response right right down to a hormone level that you were mm -hmm. you've been touching on throughout this entire little bit here yeah and i mean i i don't i didn't really touch on this a whole lot but the resistance training is certainly unique for for that the anabolic response for that increase in testosterone so i think for i mean this is kind of out in left field but people trying to conceive like get deadlifting, like get lifting heavy ass weights. You're going to get jack up that testosterone, get your hormones balanced out. And I mean, I'm not saying it's going to fix it, but is it any coincidence that a lot of people have problems with this these days and don't do a lot of heavy strength training? Now, obviously there's a lot of other variables in play, like diet is huge, but I mean, just to give kind of like I guess we'll call it like a, a real life value. Like how would the average individual benefit from doing something like this? Like strength training is, whew, it's pretty powerful for, again, like I said, balancing out those hormones, getting that boost in testosterone. There's lots of studies showing that um, if someone kind of goes from not training or even training, but not doing resistance training, starts a resistance training program, maintains that for even one month, their baseline testosterone will significantly increase. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that when I think I've been programming for Westland and CrossFit for maybe four years now. And when I sat down originally, I used like a lot of people because um, it was my first time programming for a CrossFit affiliate. And it was something I was very um, unsure of. Okay. Like what approach to take? Um, in a CrossFit affiliate, you, 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 in CrossFit in general, you, t you tend to find different focuses in different affiliates. Some programming is very CrossFit bias where it's pretty much daily. You have a wad at the end 
whether it's for time or an AMRAP or something, that's in the typically in the second half of your hour class. And then the first half of that hour class is always about prepping for that one single workout. So it's about mobility, general warm up, like getting your heart rate up and getting a little bit sweaty, specific warm up, like working on the skills and working on um, so skills being like your gymnastics stuff, working on warming up the barbell movements, if there are any, just being sure you know exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And then there's a little bit of a debrief and then everyone in the class goes ahead and does, does the wad. It's a great system. I think it works really, really well. And I think that if it's done properly and it's coast coached effectively, it's, I mean, look how far CrossFit come. Right. And that, yeah. that's like the, I would call that like the CrossFit model solely. Um, there's some CrossFit gyms that just take programming from other things and just apply it randomly to their day. I wouldn't recommend this one as much. <laughs> um, I try to steer clear of this as much as possible. If, if you're on Instagram scrolling through CrossFit gyms um, or like generic CrossFit programming, like comp train or linchpin or something like that. And then you see that workout a week later at your gym. I'm not sure that they're doing <laughs> you sneaky. a proper service in a lot of these gyms are very upfront with what programming they're following and the programming is good. I just, it's not the best, right? And I would like to think that you'd want the best for your community when you're doing that. Hopefully that doesn't, doesn't hurt any feelings, but that's just how, that's how I feel. Oh, you, you can feel, you can feel differently and I'm okay with that, but um, that's how I feel personally. The decision that I made at Westland and CrossFit was to make the programming strength biased. And the reason why I decided to make the programming strength biased was exactly for what we've been talking about this entire podcast is the different hormone responses across a spectrum of fitness from aerobic to anaerobic training or the high intensity interval stuff to the resistance training. Most people in our community are going to get the greatest benefit from the resistance training from a health perspective from right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, just, people are less likely to do, or pardon me, they're much more likely to do aerobic training on their own. Yeah. And, and the strength stuff, what it does is it's a controlled environment that we can focus on movement quality. Right. It's typically yeah. not an absurd amount of volume. Right. It's not like you're doing 20 back squats as fast as you possibly can at a very light load. And just whatever happens from the waist down happens. You Which just, a lot of people think that's what it is. Just slam it down and stand it up and hope for the best. We can implement tempos to control the speed at which the, the group is going through the movement. So we can increase our positional strength. That will help with things like ligament and tendon health. Um, we can control the volume. There's just, there's a lot more benefits from, a just a general health standpoint from the things I just mentioned that ligament yeah. tendon health, um, movement quality, safety being another thing. Um, and then the hormone response, right? That testosterone increase yeah. and the regulation of, and balancing of, of your hormones doesn't matter what they are, right? right? Yeah. Just balancing those things out and get, getting it together is more beneficial to our member base than it would be for them to come in and we crush them every single day. It's that stuff is it's sexy, right? It's like the CrossFit and time and fall, right? It's like, <laughs> Our, our group gets that on a regular basis when it fits into the plan, but our priority is making sure that these people are healthy and strong first. And yeah. then if they can express their fitness in that environment, then we can encourage them to express yeah. their fitness in that more chaotic sort of setting. Yeah. That's awesome. Like you hit the <clears throat> nail on the head there, getting that, getting that beneficial hormonal response and getting it early. Cause as you get older, it gets harder to get that response, especially especially if you've never done resistance training, you never done resistance training before. And then you hit the age of 60 and you try and start. That's tough. You're going to yeah. have a tough road ahead. But I mean, even just back to the testosterone thing, like why do you think men, even women 
when they get older are getting that testosterone replacement theory or pardon me, testosterone replacement treatment. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because one, you need it for overall health. You need it for brain health, but two, they just, they just didn't put in the work in their early years to get that. So now all of a sudden they have to get that replacement therapy. And by then, I mean, sometimes it's too late. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a, that's interesting. I never heard that before that you kind of, how you chose to prioritize the strength. But again, I don't really have, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with kind of what other gyms prioritize, but it's interesting to hear that. And mm -hmm. I would, not that it means anything, but I, I would definitely agree with that priority over the other one. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I can't speak on their intentions or their perspectives or anything like that, but from, for me, just using those three different styles of kind of the trends that I've seen across the CrossFit affiliates. So like the CrossFit model, um, the random, I'll call it the random model or the stolen model. Yeah. <laughs> and then the, the strength model, just, I had to make a choice of what I thought was best for the group. And this whole conversation makes me feel pretty good about my choice. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> It's nice to have that sort of, uh, I don't know, confirmation every once yeah. in a while that you're kind of doing the right thing because a lot of people will roll into our gym and I'll show them modify, welcome to gym, modify this, our workout for the day. It's like, it doesn't look like CrossFit a lot. CrossFit's a sport. CrossFit's a training methodology too, and it can be used really well, but I think it just needs some, yeah, some it's still CrossFit. Training. Right, you look at the definition of CrossFit, you look at what our group classes are doing. It, it's CrossFit. It's mm -hmm. just not only CrossFit. Yeah, <clears throat> I like that. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I think that's it. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I don't really have too much, I don't think. Or do I? We're already at, I think, hour and 20 minutes. Yeah, I think we can wrap it up after that. That's pretty good. I think the second half is really good. It was more of like a discussion, I would say. Yeah, and the first half really just like... super rambly in the first half there. That's a wrap for today, folks. Thanks again for tuning in. Sorry to cut you off there. I promise you're not missing out on anything except for Jesse and I blabbing on for a few minutes about nothing. So thanks again for tuning in. Please, if you liked this episode, share this with your friends, family, anyone you think might like it. Give us a review. Give us a rating. This will help boost us up there and get us out to an additional audience. We'd love to bring this information to as many people as possible. If you'd like to get in contact with either one of us, if you have some suggestions for future topics, you're interested in the services that either one of us provide, please feel free to reach out to either one of us at any time. Our information is always attached in these episodes. It's attached in our bio. But briefly, you can find Jesse on Instagram at Sheriff's Performance Academy. You can find me also on Instagram at BrainIgnition underscore Chet. Both of our website info also in all of those details. So please reach out to us. We love hearing from people, but have a great week.